This is the I Love Success Podcast. I'm Peter Jumrukowski, and I have made a vow to myself to help as many people as possible to achieve their dreams. Let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome back to the I Love Success Podcast and my virtual world tour. Uh, I've been to Australia, and uh, I've been to Toronto, uh, I've been to Los Angeles, and now I am in New York today, uh, meeting virtually with an amazing man who has dedicated his life to the art of acting and coaching others. He's the founder of Terry Knickerbocker uh, Coaching Acting Studio, and he loves to help others perform and excel in this beautiful art. So let's welcome Terry Knickerbocker. Peter, that was a great introduction. And I, I have to say, I love the title of your podcast. I love success because I love to work with people who are all in on being the very best they can be. And that of course leads to success. Yeah. And I, I saw that on your, on your website and I truly, you, you wrote training the passionate actor committed to excellence. Uh, So can we just talk about that? When does a person know that they are going to be committed to excellence? Like when, when, when does that happen in the human mind? (laughs) You know, I don't know if I have a, an answer for that. I mean, sometimes you you told me that you uh, have a karate background and when did, when did you start karate? I started when I was uh, six. So at what point did it move from being something that interested you into something that you were all in on being the best you could be? For me, it was when I I went to some competitions. First, I lost. I wanted to become better. And then I, I started winning and I realized I still was, there was still so much room for growth. And then I decided, hey, I want to really, I, I really want to go all in on this and, and, and see how good can I become. So how old were you when that happened? I think I was probably 18 or 19. Yeah, that feels right. I'm thinking about right now uh, a hockey player um, who uh, came up when I was a kid, a guy named Bobby Orr, yeah. who played for the Boston Bruins. And I think he became a professional hockey player at the age of 17. He was a phenomenal Canadian hockey player, just like world-class, like Muhammad Ali. Mm. And, um, you know, in Canada, they start skating before they start walking. And, and, and hockey's a huge thing there. And obviously he had talent, but I think there was something in his mindset that said, I need to do this and I'm all in on it. And he loved the competition and something got sparked there. So sometimes it can happen very young. Um, for me, as an actor, I I started acting when I was like five, um, and loved it and did it for fun. It was just a fun thing to do. And my, my family took me to a lot of theater growing up and it was just my favorite thing to do. It was not until my early twenties that I went, I really need training because I want to be good at this. I was doing it for fun and I was getting cast in a lot of things. And I actually got kicked out of college because I was acting. I was supposed to be a French major and I wasn't going to any classes. So I loved it, but it wasn't clear to me that for me at that time, oh my God, I have to do this. And if I'm going to do it, I have to be good, which means that I have to get training. And then I applied to New York University, which is a world-class training for actors and and, um, got in. And then my mission was clear. So I don't know when that switch goes on in people. I think it can be early and I think it can be late. Yeah. Um, some people are late bloomers. Yeah. And do you, do you witness that as an acting coach now? Do you, do you witness that spark when people really are dedicated to taking it to the next level? I am looking for that spark. Right. We, you know, New York is probably got more acting training 
than any other place in the world, including Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, and it is known as the Mecca of where you want to go to become the best actor you can be, whether that's a university or, I'm so sorry, my phone's going off. Let me turn that off. Um, or you want to go to the kind of school I have, which is sort of a retail acting thing. And there's a lot of those here. So most acting studios, if you have a pulse, meaning a heartbeat and a checkbook or a MasterCard, you're in. Mm. And we're actually very selective because there's no worse feeling than being in an acting class as a student and having a partner who's less dedicated than you, who's thinking of it as a hobby, right? So when I meet a prospective student, first of all, we have that thing that you quoted, training the passionate actor committed to excellence. That's everywhere in my studio. That's in every email we send out. That, that tagline is our brand, right? We're all about people who are all in to be the best they can be. How good do they want to be? And then when I meet them, the first question I'll ask them is, well, I'll say, how can I help you? Which is a great question, but really the question is, what are your goals? And that question starts to weed out people who are more casual about it. And so, and I tell them part of the interview is in a way to scare them, right? Like I, I don't, I think it's because this is a two year journey. And so it's not like a gym membership where you join and then you decide like karate my son you mentioned karate he went to karate when he was like four and he wasn't into it so we were paying by the month so then we just dropped out and that was fine but my school is like a two-year commitment so you don't want to commit to something and then a month or two in go you know what i don't think i'm into this you're too hardcore for me so we use the interview to self-select the right the right person which means some people i'm not right for or we're not right for them, and that's great to know. And I'm looking for someone who could say, you see it in their eyes and you can hear it in their voice, that acting feels like a calling, like they have to do it. It's not just that they like it, and it's not because they want to be famous, because we can't control that, and it's not because other people tell them that they should be an actor. It's because nothing else makes them happier, and they have talent, but they don't know how to do it. And then the purpose of coming to train is to get the skills and the process for working that sets you up to be able to become the best actor you can be. It takes two years to train and then like 10 to 20 years to master it through practice. And uh, it's interesting you're talking about setting goals and there's systems, but being a creator is also uh, being very creative, right? And, and, I, I meet a lot of people that are creators and sometimes some of them struggle with the structure and the goal settings and things right. of that nature. So how, how does that tie in and how can creators listening to this right now become better in structuring and setting goals to, to, to actually get somewhere? You know, I was doing a little research on, on you and I think you have like a three-step process right? It's right in line with what I think about. Yeah. So here's what I remember, and I don't think I'll get it right, but it's like, have a dream, make a plan, take action. Yeah. Am I close? Yeah, very close. Yeah. Right. So that makes sense because as Dr. Phil says, someday is not a day of the week. So it's fine to say, okay, I, the goal I'm interested in is the following goal. I want to be the very best actor I can be. Right. I don't want to be better than Brad Pitt. Right. I want to be the best actor I can be with my body, my DNA, my talent, whatever that is. It's not a goal to say I want to win an Oscar because that's not up to you. Yeah. You'd have to be in the right project, have the right marketing behind you and have the right votes. So I can't control that, but I can control what I do with my talent. With that goal, then we can say, OK, if that's the North Star, where does training fit in, right? Because there are all kinds of ways to train. And I would say that my training is trying to be a very elite training. Yeah. Like we want to be in the Olympics. We want to work hard and play hard and be the very best we can be. And luckily for me, I didn't have to come up with the structure because my mentor 
was a man named William Esper, and his mentor was a man named Sanford Meisner. And Sanford Meisner came up with this amazing system 70 years ago, which I follow in a very orthodox way. And it is a brilliant approach pedagogically, step by step by step. Again, I'm imagining very similar to martial arts training, mm -hmm. where you start with white belt and there's certain things you do and then you progress. And if you keep following the steps and practice every day, you will get there. You will certainly learn it, right? So the system is very, very, I know it's a, it's two years, 64 classes, twice a week for eight months a year. So 128 classes. And it's very precise and very clear. And I know what I'm doing structurally in every class. And each class builds on the class before it, right? So the structure, I luckily didn't have to come up with. But it really helped because when I trained at NYU, the structure was very hit or miss. And it actually started, I would, it, it would be as if you started karate training with a tournament, yeah. right? And that makes no sense, right? You wouldn't start playing the violin with a concerto. You'd start with a scale, right? With what maybe you would call a kata, yeah. right? And you wouldn't start dance training with Swan Lake, but most uh, Western acting training starts with scenes, right? And Meisner came up with the equivalent of scales. And so they're very helpful to take an actor step by step by step, sort of like juggling where you start with one ball and then you add a second. And then when that feels secure, you add a third. And that systematic approach to training gives a very clear structure, which was incredibly helpful and liberating for me. I mean, they they say that discipline and structure equals freedom. Yes, we, exactly. Which is, but if you talk to a lot of people that are talented, so to speak, yeah. uh, they hate structure. They hate, they hate discipline. And so how do you, how do you tie that in with creators? Is that a challenge for you or? No, because every, you know, look, actors are weird. I mean, there are a lot, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of weird and flaky actors, but if you don't have good professional habits, you're not going to work. You can't, I mean, you can't just be late. You can't not know your lines. You show up on set for a new project for Netflix and there's a hundred people on set and they've committed $20 million or more to the project. You can't be a flake. So you can't just be, I'm talented because you also have to know your lines, which means put your butt in a chair and learn your lines. And you have to have worked out all the moments so that your work is clear and precise and interesting, right? So I have a student right now, she, she's very talented, but she won't do the work. And you can see it in her work, that her work is very hit or miss, and she knows it. She's one of those people you're talking about. Oh, I just hate to sit down and get into structure. I just want to wing it, but that doesn't work. Yeah. It's, it's sad to see all those talents. I know in karate, my, my father is my sensei, and I wasn't mm. talented at all, mm. uh, but I had this inner drive to, to become good and do the work. And looking now when I'm in the position I am and I have had the performances that I've had, it feels good that I did that work. And I feel bad when I see, when I meet those uh, guys and girls that could have been champions but they weren't willing to do the work and i can see it in their eyes now that they have that regret uh, which yeah. is which is sad uh, what would you how would your best students th describe you like your favorite students how would they describe you as a coach well i want to first of all just make a distinction between the part of my work that's related to coaching and the part of my work that's related to teaching because I, yeah. they're two separate streams of work for me. Yeah. Um, so they would probably, if, if it were the coaching people, which are like more like professional actors who are working, yeah. because in, in, in film and television, you have no time to rehearse now. And rehearsal is where you figure stuff out. So there are a lot of professional actors whose name you, you might know who hire me anytime they get a project. And then we go through their stuff a couple weeks before, a couple months before to really 
make sure everything's mapped out because if you're a film and TV actor, you have to show up on set ready to go loaded up, not just knowing your lines, but having a performance, an idea, a roadmap. So I think those people would describe me as um, smart, um, full of good ideas, uh, fun to work with, and very detail oriented so that they always leave a session, hopefully, um, feeling like, oh, I have a better handle on what I was gonna do thanks to the work we did. And it's very collaborative. Like it's not just me hand, you know, feeding them. They like, we, we talk about it, we see where they're coming from. Usually they have some ideas and then we jam on those. Um, I think my students would say some of those things, but they would see me as um, a bit more hardcore, a bit more demanding, a bit more rigorous. I like to run a tight ship, not a mean ship, but a very disciplined shift. And I don't wanna waste time. I mean, we work hard and we play hard. The acting has within it the spirit of play. You know, it's not just Navy SEALs, right? But that discipline is helpful because you gotta be all in because you're gonna be competing with people. Look, there are too many actors. It's not like lawyers and doctors where we need lots of them, right? Even with all the content there is, there's still too many actors. And so the only way to have an edge is to be the best person in the room. And the only way to be consistently the best person in the room is to work your butt off. How do you, how do you work and help your, your clients and, and students with, dealing with pressure because i i yeah. can imagine that just like being an athlete being an actor it's tremendous pressure it can be i think you know when you talk to athletes they they talk sometimes about like being in the zone and things sort of slow down like in the matrix yeah. and i think uh preparation is everything. So if you know you've done your work, you're going to feel less pressured. And there's a mantra um, that I like to use, which is like effort, yeah. which doesn't mean I don't care, but it means I'm not going to be controlled by tension. I'm doing this because I love acting. I feel good about my work. I feel ready because there's a lot of pressure on an actor and an athlete. It's, just, it's the, the World Series, it's the bottom of the ninth, your team's behind by one run, there's a guy on base, you're either gonna win the game or lose the game, right? And if you let that pressure get to you, chances are you'll freak out and stress yourself out. So you just gotta go, I'm gonna do my work, I'm gonna look for the best pitch, and hopefully I connect. I mean, Michael Jordan famously said that he, I think took 300 or more potential game winning shots and didn't win the game. And it made him a winner to do that. He wants the ball and sometimes you're not going to do it. Every actor has done bad work, but hopefully you come from a place of loving what you've done and loving the, the form and loving telling the story. And you, one thing that's cool about acting is we get to put our attention outside ourselves. So if I were to pressure myself to do a good podcast and interview with you, I'd be stressing out, but instead I put my attention on you and the Cuban cafe behind you and I'm looking at your shirt and looking at your smile and your teeth and that attention coming off myself frees me up a little bit. Yeah. So I think you have to stay loose, you have to stay playful, you know, not get tense physically and come from a place of love. I love doing this and I've done my work and I feel ready. It's a great feeling to feel like you know what you're doing and to walk in feeling I've done everything I can. And it's either gonna work out or not, but really good actors tend to be consistent. And what if it, how do you, how do you come back to your students and clients? They prepared, done all the work and they lose out on that role that they really wanted. Like what, what, what's the discussion and how do you motivate them to continue? Move on, move on. Right. There's a guy I know, you know, we, we use these things called sides, which is basically just a couple pages from a script, 
right? And you go in and you do your audition usually with some sides. And after every audition, he rips up the sides and throws them in the garbage because the work's out there. And you never know what's going to come of that. And you never know why you didn't get the part. One time, one of my first professional directing opportunities, uh, I went to school and had a wonderful, extremely talented classmate who, whose work I loved more than anybody in my class. And so when it came time to direct, man, did I want him to play the part. So he auditioned, he did a great job. It was a, it was a scene, it was a story between a man and a woman. But the best woman I saw, when they worked together, like the chemistry, because she was older and bigger, and she was the best for that part, made him look more like her son. So I wouldn't have been able to tell the right story if I cast him. So he didn't get the part. For his sake, I told him why. It wasn't because he didn't do a good audition. It was because it wasn't going to work for the project based on the other pieces in it. But actors rarely get that feedback. They usually just get, nope, you didn't get it. We loved you, but we're going in a different direction. That direction could be younger, older, taller, shorter, more blonde, less blonde, more ethnic, less ethnic. And it doesn't matter, right? Because you put the work out there. And then you move on and hopefully you get to have a lot of auditions. And if you keep doing good auditions, you're gonna get cast eventually. One of the guys I work with is uh, Sam Rockwell, who's an amazing actor. We've been working together for 28, 29 years. One time, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, he auditioned for Duncan Jones. Duncan Jones is David Bowie's son and a wonderful film director and didn't get the part. Three years later, that audition made such an impression on Duncan that he wrote a movie for Sam, a movie called Moon, which is basically a one-man show. He plays like several different clones of himself. It's an extraordinary film, one of the best performances of that year. Um, so you never know where things are going to go. He didn't know when he did that audition and didn't get the part that the director was so blown away by him that he wrote a movie for him. So I just say, don't get discouraged. Don't take it personally. You know, because look at the odds. Let's say 200 actors audition for one part. You have a half a percent chance of getting it. So all you can do is just put your best work out there and move on. I can't tell you how many actors I've worked with who the feedback they get is, we loved your work, but we're going in a different direction. You can't take that personally. You just have to get back on the horse. I think that the hardest thing is not only in acting with everything is to be unattached to the outcome, right? Because perfect. Yes. How, how do we do that? Because I was talking last week with the Alexander Volkanovsky and he's the current featherweight UFC champion mm. and, and he's mm. super composed. And we talked about that. He's like, yeah, I, I've done the work. I'm going in there. I have confidence in myself. And I mean, that's why he's the champion, but yes. people that are listening now, that want to reach that level that hold on to the result so much that they lose their performance. What do you want to tell them? You just kind of grabbed your fist. So I'd say yeah. soften your body, take a breath, say F it, yeah. do the best you can and rip up those sides. Don't be attached to the outcome. That's a very Jedi mind trick kind of thing to do. But, you know, one of my mentor's favorite books, Sanford Meisner, was a book called Zen and the Art of Archery. And it was about an archer who was very good, world class, but not quite at the top. And he heard about a sensei in Japan who was teaching archery. And so we went there and they just broke down his technique and started from scratch. They didn't even use arrows for the first three months. They just picked up the bow and pulled the string back and really focused on process, on the breath, on staying grounded in his feet, all these things that had nothing to do with bullseyes because the goal is a bullseye in, in archery. But they focused on everything but bullseye. And when he finally got arrows, the arrows were going all over the place. He was a worse archer in the middle of this process than he was when he got there. And the teacher just said, keep doing it, something's coming. 
And by trusting the process and not focusing on results, eventually you got bullseye after bullseye after bullseye. So that's very much the mindset of the work that I teach and also of being in the game. Just keep doing the work. The results will take care of themselves. They have to, because we live in a kind of cause and effect universe. So not a kind of a cause and effect, a cause and effect universe. So if you keep putting good work out there, eventually something's going to come back to you. It doesn't make sense if it doesn't. Do you think uh, a lot of people quit too early? And what do you want to say to those that are three feet from gold? Uh -huh. Yes, that's a great, that, I know where that comes from. Um, that's a great story, three feet from the gold. Um, hang in there. And if you don't, then you don't have the grit to do this because it takes grit. Yeah. You've got to have faith when the dawn is darkest. You know, here we are in this crazy crisis that's affecting the whole world. Um, you know, some businesses are doing great. Amazon is doing very well yeah. in this time. But there are a lot of businesses that are going to go out of business. And it's very scary to me as someone who, I mean, no one's coaching with me right now because there's no projects happening. Everything's on hold, right? And my business depends on students being in a room together sweating. Well, no one's going to come to New York City and sweat in a room together. First of all, we're not allowed to. And even when things open up, that'll be nervous making for people. So we've moved all our classes online. And amazingly, the classes are great. And the students are doing great work. But it does make me nervous because the next unit would be the summer intensive. And we're not getting a lot of calls because it's people are not thinking about stuff like that right now. And then I heard the other day that universities are thinking about the fall classes being online, that even by September, we won't be ready to come back together. Now, some schools are going to go out of business. They just can't sustain that because if you're a kid and you were going to go to college, you don't want to go to college online. You're going to say, let me take a gap year, which means they're not going to have the income and they're not going to have the student body. That stuff makes me nervous, makes me nervous. Um, so I'm just holding on to, we're going to pivot the best way we can. I know the work we do is great. I've got a great faculty. I've got great students. We will eventually be back in the room together and they just got to have faith and hold on and run a lean operation until we can get back there. I think that's the, these are the moments where we can really truly work on our mindset, right? Because, and the work itself. Yeah. Right? No, you're right. You know, I have a teacher. I, I'm on, an, on a Zoom call every Saturday with like 60 acting teachers from around the country. It's so helpful just to talk through this time. And this wonderful acting teacher named David Tony from down in, in Virginia said very sternly to his students, do not make it that when we're out of this, you're going to use this time as an excuse for why you didn't get better use this time to get better now, right? Use this time. And what a wonderful invitation that is. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think it, one saying that I heard that I like, if you're in your head, you're dead. And uh, mm -hmm. like, stop thinking about it. Start making small moves to improve. You, you probably had, you haven't had this much time to actually dig deep into your passions like you have right now. So what are you going to do about that? That's, that's Perfect. my question. Uh, why that. is acting and, and helping others so important to you, Terry? Two different questions. I mean, I love stories. I, I, my favorite, I love art. I love all art. Um, you know, I love paintings and sculpture and poetry and novels and music and opera and dance, all that stuff is great because art holds the mirror up to nature and is really necessary for the world. It's not frivolous. It actually heals people because when you see yourself reflected in a work of art, you feel less alone. You go, oh, that artist understands me. I feel seen. And, and that's a very meaningful thing to, to heal the human race. Um, but acting is the one and storytelling in that level is the one that appeals to me the most. So I just love it. And so what great, you know, that, that, that thing that they say that 
if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I don't, it doesn't feel like work. I, it just feels like the thing I love to do. The thing about helping others, I was very influenced uh, as a freshman at NYU by a teacher there who was a brilliant teacher, but kind of mean and uh, could say very cruel things as sometimes teachers do. And I don't think that's a wise thing to do. He was brilliant. He knew what he was doing. But I saw him say things that I found injurious to other people and that stay, stay with me. And so it took a long time before I gave myself permission to be a, a teacher because I thought it's, it's like you're holding that person's heart in your hands and I didn't want to do any damage. Um, but when I eventually moved to teaching, it seemed like, okay, I, I, I think I have some, some talent for this. It seemed like that was the feedback I'm getting. And I love, I love, it's like, you know, having, watching my son grow. I love helping people to become the very best. There he is. Hi, buddy. There you are. <laughs> the very best, the very best that they can be. Right. Like that's my particular jam is just like, let me help you reach your potential. I have a pretty good eye for seeing the germ of talent and the possibility. Right. Which is small and just helping it to really emerge and take shape and grow and, and expand. Hey, bud, how you doing? <laughs> um, so that's that's exciting for me and just so meaningful. It's so meaningful for me to see someone. I had a woman from Puerto Rico, she was an attorney, and she came to me to want to study when my studio first opened. And she was very tight, she was in her head, um, her body was locked up, and I was there like, I, I don't know if this is gonna work out, right? And her work at first was very restricted, and, but she was hungry. And she, she was doing it because she had a love to try it. She, you know, it would obviously be much easier for her just to be an attorney. And so she did everything I suggested. I said, get into movement class. She did that. I said, get into voice class. She did that. And with the combination of that ambition and drive and hard work, all of a sudden the hard shell around her heart started to open up and man, did she blossom. I mean, she just like, she was like that, fable of the tortoise and the hare and the tortoise is running and the I mean the hare is running and the tortoise is going slow and you go how's this guy going to win the race but she came out so strong and so interesting and her work is so human and moving to watch I mean I just get chills thinking about her growth that's exciting that's so exciting to be part of that and to help her and to see it it's so rewarding yeah, no, it's it's beautiful, and to to help others grow is one of the most beautiful beautiful things. And I, uh, we were talking about success in in the beginning of the podcast. Yeah. Like, I'm yes. my goal is to redefine success, and that's why I meet with thought leaders just like yourself. Can you just share what's your definition of success? I was going to ask you what yours was. Yeah, so I have. I think my definition is something that I've heard from Maya Angelou, and that's uh, do, doing what you like, how you like it, when you like it. Mm. That sounds great. Um, but I'm still working on improve. it. I'm, I'm learning new yeah. things from the people that yes. I meet, and I know that success should be different for everybody. You shouldn't change, yes. you shouldn't change right. someone else's success. Right. I don't think success is, is external validation. So I don't think you're a success because you won an Oscar. I think success has to do with, if it comes to acting, ultimately playing leading parts the best you can um, in projects you care about. Right. So if you would love to be in A Streetcar Named Desire, that's a part, that's a project you'd love to do, that Tennessee Williams play, and you'd love to play Blanche, or you'd love to play Stanley. And you have something to add to it that comes from the artist in you, meeting the artist in Tennessee Williams who wrote that. That's fantastic, right? And I think uh, a life success would be to be able to do that consistently so that you get up every morning and you do the very best job you can collaborating with other wonderful artists, meaning writers, actors, directors, editors, sound people. That's thrilling, 
right? And to be able to do that and then to learn from your mistakes and come back and do it again better the next day. That to me would be success. So success for me has to do with longevity. Yeah. Right. I love that. And, and also I really like what you were saying. It's not about the external validation. Right. Uh, and it ties into something Tom Bilyeu said, success is how you like yourself when you're with yourself. That's right. That's uh, right. When no one's around. Yeah. Are you proud of yourself when no one's around? Right. That private behavior says everything. I, I love that. I like his, I like listening to him. He's all yeah. in. He, he's awesome. And I, yeah. and I think also when, when we talk about being successful and especially when we, when we talk about performance and acting, I, I love acting. And mm. one thing that I, I, I'm always fascinated is that people that are doing the projects that they really want to do. Absolutely. Which sometimes means, because it is a business too, and actors have to be their own CEOs. It's not just the art form. You have to create opportunities uh, for yourself and you have to play some games, right? Not in a way that makes you a prostitute, but in a way that just puts you in all the rooms you want to be in. So uh, sometimes an actor will say, okay, one for me, one for them. So I'll do a Marvel movie which is not necessarily the artistic pinnacle for me, but that creates an opportunity and a buzz because it's going to be huge that lets me do that small independent film of my favorite weird Italian novel where I love the part, but I know that people are not going to be flocking to theaters to see it, but I know I will love the work I do. And so sometimes you have to go big and go small to be able to do the work that you love to do. And sometimes you have to, um, take meetings with people who um, can open doors for you, right? Still saying authentic, but you do have to play, you have to, you have to have thin skin in the work and very thick skin around the business and take as many meetings as you can and meet, meet, meet as many people as you can and not be a jerk, but also not just, not just um, go along with things. Hang on just one second. Henry, you gotta be quiet, buddy. I'm talking to somebody. He's playing his <laughs> instrument, right? <Okay. laughs> um, you know, um, there's a guy whose name I'm forgetting, um, but he's, he's, he has a reputation as being kind of difficult to work with. And he would say, Bubba, shh, I got to talk to this guy. We'll have a concert in a minute. Okay, can you stop playing that, please? Let me have that for a second, okay? Please? Thanks. Um, Isn't it amazing uh, it, it's, to be it, a, a kid? Like it's great. Everything it's is great. Exciting, he's so free. You know? He yeah. is. He's free and full of feelings. Yeah. And this guy said, why are, you, why are you saying I'm difficult? Don't we care about the same thing? So if I say, listen, can we do another take? That doesn't make me a diva. That makes me saying, let's get this as good as we can. Yeah. Right? And I like that. I like that commitment to excellence and not just being uh, political about things. I mean, I recognize that uh, when we talk about commitment to excellence and when you were talking about your, I haven't personally been to your acting classes, but I, I would love to, uh, but You're it welcome. Feels like you, yeah, thank you. It feels like you are intense, just like my, my father and sensei. And I know when I was training for big tournaments, I recognize what you said in the beginning. I wanted to be in the room with people that had the same goals as me. It pissed That's me off right. if people didn't yeah. want to do their best. Because then right. they, they ruined my training. And right. I, I was pretty intense about that. I didn't mean to be rude. It was just that this is my dream and I take it 100% seriously. Absolutely. You know, we have an agreement with students that they have to rehearse between every class. That's on them. That's a discipline. So they come to class twice a week for three and a half hours of class and then they have to rehearse with their partner. That's the agreement. That's our contract. They know that going in. And I say, if that's not working out, do your best to work it out. But if you can't work it out together, come to me to talk to me about it. And they go, oh, I don't want to be a tattletale or a snitch. I say, this is your money and your classes. And if it's not working out, we'll fix it. And either that person's going to come around or they'll leave my studio. If they can't, if they can't abide by the agreement, it's not going to work out. And so that frees people up to have 
high expectations. Maybe you're not going to vote for the same person that person votes for. Maybe you don't have the same taste in music, but you should be able to count on the fact that if they're in class with you, they're just as all in as you are. They're going to bring their best game. Where, where do you want to see, like, like if you look at your life and you, you dedicated your life to this, where do you see your work the next five, 10 years? What, what are your goals and your mission? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel great about where I am right now, um, which doesn't mean I don't have ambition. I'm just really pleased with who I've been able to become so far and who I've surrounded myself and the amazing students and the amazing staff and the amazing clients that I get to work with. So I would just say more of the same, right? Like um, I want to work with, I want to meet some new actors uh, to, to teach who, who inspire me. I want to meet, I want to work with some wonderful professional actors that I haven't worked with yet on great projects and great scripts. Um, you know, I was lucky enough in the last couple of years through referrals to get to work with some great people like Zac Efron, Sasha, Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, these are new clients for me because I have a bunch of regulars and, um, working with those guys was so inspiring because they're great and they had great projects. Like they're at the top of their game. So to be honored by them trusting me to work on something with them and have it come out well, that's thrilling. I love that. That's a lot of fun and, and very, what a great honor. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And I think that's the, 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 reward you get from dedicating your life to something right yeah yeah i mean you know those guys are are trusting me they're saying you know help me with this project and it's like happening now and there's a lot of money writing on it and a lot of all kinds of stuff and they're like okay well i'm just going to do the best i can i don't feel pressured by that i just feel excited that's good you trust your abilities I do. And, and that took a long time. You know, yeah, I had to make some mistakes. I was a very bad teacher when I started. Right. I would say but that is to say I was good for some people, but I turned some people off because I was trying to be my teacher. And, and he had a, he was a very big personality. And so he could sometimes say some very arrogant things, which he could get away with. But when I did it, it was like, dude, who the hell are you? Shut up. And I had to make those mistakes to go, oh, I got to be my, my version of the teacher. He's got to be his version of the teacher. That took some, I, that took a lot of mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. We do. And, and I, I, it's, I think modeling is so important, uh, yes. but also to find like what's our own core values, right? That's right. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, Peter, Peter, I have to say that everything you say is so aligned with what I believe in. There's nothing you've said that made me go, okay, I'll go along with this, but that's not me. Like yeah. we are completely simpatico, yeah. which is Thank fascinating you. to me. It, yeah. it is fascinating. And I think martial arts is in a way very similar. Bruce Lee said that is the art yeah. of expressing the human body. And I think yeah. that's very similar to acting in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And be like water. That's good yeah. too. Um, but yeah, the body the, the, and the voice, right? Yeah. So the voice is a very important part of what we work with. How how important is is it to have uh, to? We talk about when you act and pain. How important is pain in an actor's career and being able to express that? When you say pain, do you mean emotional pain or physical pain? Uh, emotional pain. Well, uh, ho hopefully an actor doesn't focus on one particular color, yeah. right? So I would say that what makes a great actor, among other things, is um, a richly lively temperament in all directions. Mm -hmm. So they can laugh, they can cry, they can get mad, they can get embarrassed. And we have an idea uh, usually that, oh, happiness is a good feeling and sadness or hurt is a bad feeling but that would be like saying to a musician that a, a, a major chord is a 
is a nice chord and a minor chord or a diminished chord is a bad chord or the color blue is great but the color brown is not as good but really they're just part of nature and so um, pain's not important but freedom and truth and authenticity and access to all your feelings is important does that come from ex uh, your own experience uh, to be able to pervade as an actor or can you can you learn those those things well luckily um, if you're a human being those feelings are usually part of the possibility now it's true that in in growing up some people get the message that certain feelings are unacceptable so like if you had a marine drill sergeant for a father and he said don't cry boys don't cry, you would start to shut down your vulnerability. Or if you were kind of a wild child and then you got into trouble and you were told, "Don't you're, you're too crazy, man. You need anger management. Don't get angry. Then you would start to shut that down. So sometimes the training is as much about unlearning as it is about learning to gain, to regain access to what was your birthright. I Now, Certain people just in their temperament are fuller than others. My son is full of feelings. He, when he laughs, he laughs. When he cries, he cries. When he gets mad, he gets mad. I think in a way that was more intense than me as I remember myself as a kid. That's just him. Other people are a little bit more contained. So you do want to free that up in a, in a vigorous way, but, but some people have it in smaller amounts than others. But as long as they can kind of get that going, they'll get what they need. And Terry, who, who fills you up? Because you're giving so much to yeah. others. Uh, how, how do you keep your cup full, so to speak? Yeah. Well, I think you have to, you know, um, self-care is important. Uh, it's, first of all, my family's amazing. My son makes me smile and full of love every day. And we're very affectionate. My wife, I have an amazing wife who is a former actor and is a, a therapist and is from Ireland. And um, she's funny and passionate and deep. And um, one of the amazing benefits of this pandemic we're in is that I'm home all the time. So I have so much more time with them than I would if I were working at my studio. And that's an incredible blessing. So that's great. Um, working out. I have an amazing trainer um, who's a genius at the body and also very funny. And right now we're doing it on FaceTime, but I love, you know, that's very helpful to take care of the body. I like cooking. Um, I love playing the guitar that really fills my soul up. So every day I'm playing a little guitar and every day I'm doing something physical and every day I'm with my family and then going to see work, you know, and, and watching good shows. And right now it's all, online, I can't go to a theater, um, listening to music, uh, talking to my mom, she's 93. Oh, wow. And, uh, and uh, obviously, we can't visit her right now. But she's, she's going strong. That's great. That's awesome. Being in touch with friends. Um, just living life the fullest way I can. I love that. And have you uh, during this what's going on right now we have more time have you had a chance to reflect on your own life and kind of see it how, what's going to happen how am i going to show up when this is over or yeah well i gotta say i don't feel like i have a lot more time because uh <laughs> me too <laughs> i have I'm less teaching actually <laughs> it feels like it yeah i'm teaching a lot and also you know my son needs some support uh you know, school was a babysitter. So now that there's no school, my wife is handling his online learning and there's just, there seems to be a lot to do. So I don't feel like I have a massive amount of time, um, first of all. But I think the most important thing I did, because I would have said the first week of March when it looked like we were heading towards the possibility of not being able to be together, and that hadn't been decided yet. I would have said, I'm going to go out of business because there's no way to teach 
acting online. Even though I had been coaching online for 10 or 15 years when people couldn't be in the room with me. When I'm working with someone in LA, this is how we do it. Um, but I just thought, no, you can't do acting online. You can't do movement online. You can't do voice online. We're just gonna shut down and maybe we'll close our doors forever, right? I was very discouraged and very pessimistic. And then I heard that NYU, where I taught for over 30 years, and which was my alma mater, was putting their classes online, as was every university. And I went, how's that gonna work? And I went and saw my former boss at NYU, and she was very jolly. And she said, well, basically they said, do it or you're fired. And she said, what better group of people to figure it out than us, because we're improvisers. And that started to turn my head towards, maybe this could work. And then that next week, which was the week of March 15th, uh, 16th, was our spring break. So everyone was off classes. We had our last class on Friday the 13th in person, and some people were absent already. They thought it was, they were feeling sick. They didn't want to make other people sick. They thought social distancing, which was a new thing and wasn't really the norm, was the socially responsible thing to do. Um, so I had that week, I was going to go to Mexico. I canceled my trip and I said, if we're going forward, I need to save my business. And I spent that week with my staff online, with teachers online, calling everybody I knew, getting on these Zoom calls with all these other acting teachers, getting myself completely pivoted towards, we're going to do this. And we called every one of our students because they were very doubtful. And many of them were waiters, bartenders, baristas, babysitters, totally out of work and couldn't pay for class. Right. And so we called every single one of them and got everyone to buy in. That was a major thing. And it was the hardest week of my life that week before we went online. And then I thought, okay, we'll try it for a week. I don't think it's going to work, but we'll try it. Let's see. Because if it's not going to be excellent, I don't want to do it. And the work started to pop. And I've seen as good work online with people in their various homes. And they're, some of them are in Arkansas now. They've gone home. They're in San Diego. They're in Maryland. They're in Connecticut. They're in Idaho. They're all over. And they're all on these Zoom screens. And they're doing amazing work. And they're, they're all in. They're all in. And it is so inspiring. And so that's what I've learned. Because you can get complacent teaching the same thing for 30 plus years. And I've had to learn a lot. I've had to learn a different way of approaching this work that still gets at the essence of it and how to motivate people and how to get them to buy into it because it's very discouraging. The news around us gets worse and worse every day. And so to be able to shut that off and come into the space and do your work and do it full open heartedly, man, that's incredible. And I'm proud of myself and I'm so proud of the students and I'm so proud of my faculty and I'm so proud of my staff. I haven't missed a payroll, right? Um, not everyone can pay, we're, we're extending credit to people, um, but when they get a little money, they'll give it to us and we'll, get, we'll figure this out. I'm so excited and energized by that. That's what I'm taking away from this. I love that. And, and I mean, you're truly, you're a winner. You're, you're... And I love what you said. If I can't do it excellent, I'm not going to do it. Right. And I think this is challenging for all of us, but we're also going to see beautiful things just like what you have done. And all of a sudden, maybe your work is going to expand to different parts of the world. And That's interesting. Yeah, I was thinking if we have to be online in the fall or whatever, Maybe we'll get some people from Macedonia yeah. <laughs> who, who, who don't need a visa. They can just yeah. join us. Yeah, Isn't that incredible? And, it's uh, incredible. It's not what I prefer. I really long to get back in the room. This works best in the room in person, yeah. just as karate class would, yeah. right? I, I agree. And I honestly, I, I, I said no to all my podcasts virtually before. I never done, before this happened, I never done a virtual podcast because I, I love yeah, we were supposed to, to meet in person. Yeah, I was supposed to be in LA this work this yeah. week, and I canceled that trip. You know, so I've been pivoting as well. And yeah, I mean, I would love to sit face to face to you and give you a hug and thank you for an amazing conversation. Ditto, uh, very, my friend. Uh, 
So we're going to finishing up, finish up now. I just want to ask you one, one last question. We're all about sharing tools and journeys as we've done today. But at the end of the day, I want the, the people that are watching and listening to this to, to actually take action in their own life. And so what would be your best advice for them to, to, to go after their dream and what could be their first step? Yeah. Uh, you know, this guy, James Clear, Atomic Habits, he's an interesting fellow and he, he studies how to create good habits and he's really into micro steps. So I think what intimidates people is if they want to climb Mount Everest, they, they think about the top instead of just the first step. So any step will help. So I'd say clarify the dream and, and, and do what you love. Don't do it because it's what your mother wants you to do or what your, your, your family says you should do or your, your neighbors. Like what is going to make you want to get up in the morning and do something? And it's never too late to pursue that. I mean, in some cases, if you want to be a professional basketball player and you're 60 years old, that's challenging. But maybe you can coach or maybe you could write like there's some way you can get closer to the thing that makes you happy. There was a book years ago that said, do what you love and the money will follow. And so I would say the most important thing is to identify what would make you want to get up in the morning and approach that from love rather than fear, right? Fear is going to come in. Don't listen to that voice. Acknowledge it, but say, I, I want to do this. And then what is the first step you can take towards that? And just keep taking steps one by one by one. Thank you, Terry, for sharing that. Are you taking on students now? If there are people listening and watching this that would love to work with you? I, I am, uh, and also coaching clients for when these projects start up again. Um, you know, we're happy to have a conversation. We don't believe in auditions. A lot of schools do auditions, but we just do it through conversations. So they're welcome to look for my website, uh, Terry Knickerbocker Studio, all one word, dot com or Terry Knickerbark Studio on Instagram. We have a lot of fun on Instagram. You can message us and reach out and we'll be happy to have a conversation and see if it's a good fit, if we can help you to achieve your dreams. Terry, thank you so much. We'll share those links as well. Yeah. I appreciate your time. I appreciate what you do and that you are sharing so open heartedly. A big mm -hmm. shout out to our friend matthew del negro who great guy introduced us to together i'm super grateful for that he's an amazing guy and um, i'm just so grateful for this uh, is uh, there anything you want to say before we leave for, for 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 the day well first of all i want to say peter you're a gentleman you're i can sense your kindness i think kindness is very important right now and patience it's stressful times so self-care is really important um take take it easy go slow lower your expectations a little bit and know that things aren't going to work out sometimes just through technology and just be kind to yourself and to others and um yeah uh try to enjoy this time the best you can it's a hard time we're in and everybody knows someone who got sick or who's perished and i hope we come out on the other side of this a kinder gentler warmer uh world i hope yeah. we do yeah I, I i truly hope so as well that we remember and my yoga teacher says put your head in your heart that's something mm. that i'm working on yes. and um, everybody that are still here listening an hour into this incredible conversation first off thank you for your time uh, we course. do this for you and if you want more of these conversations go to i love success dot co uh, we have almost 180 conversations now with top leaders just like terry uh, also giving away a couple of free chapters of my book because uh, at the end of the day we're giving all of this for free the yep. only thing we ask is that you you take your life seriously enough to do something beautiful with, with it to yes, go after your right. dreams to do what you love and if you enjoy this conversation, share it with somebody that can have, 
have some meaning in listening to this that also can improve their life. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm.